I'd like to welcome you to the 10th Annual Sacred Trust History Talks and Book Signing event. This is presented by the Gettysburg Foundation and by Gettysburg National Military Park. The Gettysburg Foundation is the nonprofit partner of the National Park Service at Gettysburg. I am Cindy Small, Director of Marketing for the Gettysburg Foundation, and it gives me great pleasure to tell you a little bit about the topic and the speaker of our next presentation. As we're focusing on 1864 and various events surrounding that in this year's talks, by the summer of 1864, Abraham Lincoln was gloomily convinced he would be defeated in the next election. In anticipation, Lincoln circulated a folded memorandum to his cabinet on August 23rd, which he asked them all to sign as witnesses without reading. In that memorandum, Lincoln laid out what he felt he must do in the event that his opponent, George B. McClellan, was elected. All of these anxieties are wrapped around the blind memorandum, making it the most mysterious and impenetrable document Lincoln ever wrote. Well, let me tell you a little about our speaker who's going to talk further on that topic. Dr. Alan Gelzo is Director of Civil War Era Studies at Gettysburg College. He is the Henry R. Lucci Professor of the Civil War Era, also at Gettysburg College. He is well-renowned for his books, the author of numerous books on Lincoln, and in 2013, his book, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, won the Fletcher Pratt Award. Dr. Gelzo has contributed articles to newspapers and periodicals. He's been featured on Weekend Edition Sunday, Meet the Press, and The Daily Show. Together with Patrick Allett and Gary Gallagher, he team taught the Teaching Company's new edition of the American History series. Would you please join in me in a great, warm, sacred trust welcome for Dr. Alan Gelzo. I always have to negotiate with these mics. I'm, I'm taller than they are. That presents a problem. I've been hitting my head on doorways all of my life. Never been able to find a way around that. Abraham Lincoln's mature style as a writer and a speaker was always terse, with little wastage of words. Leonard Sweat, with whom Lincoln had worked as a lawyer in the old days in Illinois, thought that the great secret of his power as an orator lay in the clearness and perspicuity of his statements, so that when Lincoln had stated a case, it was always more than half argued and the point more than half won. Lincoln loathed blowhards. He remarked to a legal protege in Illinois that one Chicago merchant who had turned politician can compress the most words into the fewest ideas of any man I ever knew. Sometimes, however, the terseness could border on the cryptic. When Lincoln explained my idea of democracy in 1858 in these words, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master, this was actually more of a quizzical expression of his distaste for slavery than it was a useful description of democracy. When he assured James Ashley, and you'll remember this from Spielberg's Lincoln movie, when he assured James Ashley in the midst of the struggle in the House of Representatives over the 13th Amendment that, so far as I know, there are no peace commissioners in the city, or likely to be in it, Lincoln was keeping so close to the bare minimum that his note almost amounts to deception. But no document in the standard eight volumes of Lincoln's collected writings is quite so cryptic or quite so impenetrable as the 60 words which comprise what Roy Basler and the editors of the collected works entitled Memorandum Concerning His Probable Failure of Re-Election, and which Mark Neely in the Abraham Lincoln Encyclopedia simply described as the blind memorandum of August 23rd 1864. It reads, Executive Mansion, Washington, August 23, 1864. This morning, as for some days past, 
it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be re-elected. Then it will be my duty so to cooperate with the president-elect as to save the union between the election and the inauguration, as he will have secured his election on such ground that he cannot possibly save it afterwards. Now, on a, one, at least one level, the blind memorandum seems to be fairly straightforward. First, Lincoln has come to the conclusion that he will not be re-elected to the presidency in the November 8, 1864 national election. Second, he will use the three months between the lost election and the inauguration of the new president on March 4th, 1865, to put on as much steam as possible to win the war. And then third, this window of opportunity would exist only until March 4th, 1865, because the new president, and no one doubted on August 23rd that the soon-to-assemble Democratic National Party Convention would nominate George B. McClellan as its candidate, would have been elected on a peace platform that would, once he actually became president, make it impossible, or at least unlikely, that the war would be won, much less continued. This was not a terribly optimistic assessment of Lincoln's political fortunes, and it's especially odd coming from a president who had frequently expressed his determination to carry the war forward to a successful reconstruction of the Union and without legalized slavery, no matter what. Only a year before, in a public letter that he wrote for a statewide Republican mass meeting in Springfield, Illinois, Lincoln had seized on the recent twin victories of Gettysburg and Vicksburg as evidence that the signs look better that peace does not appear so distant as it did. And only days before the August 23rd memorandum, Lincoln had appeared to Wisconsin Governor Alexander Randall and Judge Joseph Mills to be a man of deep convictions and an unutterable yearning for the success of the Union cause, and convinced that he should be damned in time and eternity if he backslid from the emancipation cause. When Ulysses Grant quizzed him in the spring of 1865 whether he had at any time doubted the final success of the cause, Lincoln's prompt and emphatic reply was, never for a moment. And he leaned forward in his camp chair and enforced his words by a vigorous gesture of his right hand. I'm imitating what it should be. <laughs> But Lincoln always had a realistic respect for contingency. There was, Lincoln said to Grant, a limit to the sinews of war, and a time might be reached when the spirits and resources of the people would become exhausted. And in the most immediate political sense, the blind memorandum also reflects an element of realism in Lincoln's assessment of what had happened and not happened over the spring and summer of 1864. In that time, most of the contingencies looked like they had gone disastrously awry. First of all, Grant's overland campaign, which had jumped off with high expectations that it would finish the war in 1864, had instead turned into a series of head-to-head -head battles across northern Virginia, ending in nothing more decisive than a siege of the Confederate capital at Richmond. Second. The coordinated campaigns Grant had entrusted to William T. Sherman in Georgia, to Franz Siegel in the Shenandoah Valley, to Ben Butler on the James River, and Nathaniel Banks against Mobile, Alabama, had produced even less. Sherman had tic-tacked across northern Georgia and was now locked in another apparently pointless siege of Atlanta. Siegel's campaign in the Shenandoah Valley had been blunted and then reversed as a Confederate raid under Jubal Early stormed down the valley, crossed into Maryland, and in July even threatened Washington itself. Ben Butler had landed his army of the James at Bermuda 100 and proceeded to threaten Richmond only to be driven back into the Bermuda 100 Peninsula like a bottle tightly corked. And Nathaniel Banks took his own counsel 
and launched a botched operation up Louisiana's Red River, from which his command escaped by the skin of its teeth. Then, the federal conscription law, signed by Lincoln in March of 1863, triggered a wave of urban riots in the, no in the North, riots which frequently turned into racial pogroms. And three new draft calls in February, March, and July of 1864 stimulated so much flight to Canada that a Toronto newspaper reported that our towns and villages, not only on the frontier but inland, are crowded with motley groups of fugitives from the draft. Finally, even within Lincoln's own Republican Party, radicals who were unhappy with the leniency of the Reconstruction Plan he had announced the previous December were challenging him, first with a rival plan that he pocket-vetoed in July, and then with a dump Lincoln insurgency which called its own convention in Cleveland and nominated a rival presidential candidate, John Charles Fremont. And at the same time, a conservative unionist faction at the other end of the Republican Party also considered mounting a challenge to Lincoln, claiming that he had changed the character of the war from the single object of upholding the government to that of a direct interference with the domestic institutions of the states. No wonder, after such a cascade of bad news, that Lincoln irritably informed New York politician Schuyler Hamilton that, you think I don't know I am going to be beaten, but I do. And unless some great change takes place, badly beaten, the people promised themselves when General Grant started out that he would take Richmond in June. He didn't take it, and they blame me. Ultimately, however, the blind memorandum also represents a darker aspect of Lincoln's own psyche, his weakness for depression, not unmixed with self-pity, and his expectation under stress that the likeliest results were usually the worst ones. I have hours of depression, Lincoln admitted to Iowa Congressman Josiah Grinnell. You flaxen men with broad faces are born with cheer and don't know a cloud from a star. I am of another temperament. These factors seem to suggest that the blind memorandum can be read simply as a confession of despair from a man who had plenty of reason to feel despairing. But immediately behind those factors crowd in a series of questions which render the memorandum, like Alice in Wonderland, curiouser and curiouser. Begin with the audience for whom he intended this little piece of political theater, his cabinet, which on August 23rd was composed of William Henry Seward, Secretary of State, Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, William Pitt Fessenden, Secretary of the Treasury, having just replaced Salmon Chase the month before. Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy. Edward Bates, the Attorney General, although only until the end of the year. Montgomery Blair, Postmaster General. And John Palmer Usher, Department of the Interior. We know that the blind memorandum was intended as an item of cabinet business on August 23rd, although that knowledge comes surprisingly long after the fact. Of the two great diary keepers in the cabinet, Edward Bates has no entry at all for August 23rd. And the published edition of Gideon Wells' diary for that day has only a lengthy rant about official Washington's lack of recognition for the Navy and for Admiral Farragut in particular. No mention of the blind memorandum appears in the diary or correspondence of Lincoln's secretarial staff, John Hay and John G. Nicolay. And in fact, no first-person description of the blind memorandum appears at all until 1877, when Gideon Wells, in an article written for the Galaxy magazine, described how Lincoln, born down with the anxiety and labor of recruiting, reinforcing, and supplying the army, met him, met Wells, as he arrived for the regular Tuesday cabinet meeting on August 23rd, with a sealed envelope in hand, and, as Wells recorded it, a request 
that I would write my name across the back of it. One or two members of the cabinet had already done so. In handing it to me, he remarked that he would not then inform me of the contents of the paper enclosed, had no explanation to make, but that he had a purpose, and at some future day I should be informed of it and be present when the seal was broken. Sure enough, the reverse of the blind memorandum contains the signatures of all seven cabinet secretaries, Wells fourth in order after Seward, Fessenden, and Stanton, and dated in Lincoln's hand a second time. Lincoln was as good as his word. On November 11, 1864, three days after what turned out to be a triumphant re-election, Lincoln again began a cabinet meeting with the blind memorandum in hand. And this time he had John Hay's diary as a witness. At the meeting of the cabinet today, the president took out a paper from his desk and said, gentlemen, do you remember last summer I asked you all to sign your names on the back of a paper, which I did not show you the inside? This is it. Now, Mr. Hay, see if you can get this open without tearing it. He had pasted it up in so singular a style that it required some cutting to get it open. He then read as follows. Now from that moment on November 11th, the blind memorandum suddenly became a novelty. And as Hay recounted to Nicolay in a letter in 1878 after the publication of Wells' article in the Galaxy, members of the cabinet began clamoring for copies for themselves starting with Edward Bates, followed by Wells, then everybody. Hay told Nicolay that he cussed silently at these requests. But in fact, Hay made a copy for himself, and even had the cabinet secretaries endorse it as they had the original. But far from answering any questions about the meaning of the blind memorandum, the peculiar mode of its two-stage presentation to the cabinet only deepens the mystery. Why, in the first place, did Lincoln think in August that a memorandum about his prospective defeat in the oncoming election should be presented to the cabinet? And why, when he presented it, did he then refuse to let them see the contents, hence the blind aspect of the memorandum? It has been suggested that Lincoln feared the document might be leaked, but in that case, why should he have written it at all? Nor does any of this explain why, in the second place, he wanted the cabinet to endorse it as though they were witnessing his last will and testament. If witnesses were all that he wanted, Nicolay and Hay would surely have done as well as anyone. The waters grow considerably muddier when we turn to asking what the blind memorandum actually proposed as Lincoln's course of action in the event of his defeat. The memorandum states simply that he would so cooperate with the president-elect as to save the union between the election and the inauguration. Yet the explanation Lincoln offered his cabinet on November 11th made it clear that this is exactly what he did not expect would happen. I resolved, he explained, according to Hayes' diary, in the case of the election of General McClellan, being certain that he would be the candidate, that I would see him and talk matters over with him. I would say, General, the election has demonstrated that you are stronger, have more influence with the American people than I. Now let us together, you with your influence and I with all the executive power of the government, try to save the country. You raise as many troops as you possibly can for this final trial, and I will devote all my energies to assisting and finishing the war. Now, given the rocky road that Lincoln and McClellan had traveled in 1862, the idea of cooperation between them seems almost risible. But McClellan remained enormously popular with the Army of the Potomac. Less than a year before, Secretary of War Stanton had had to squelch a movement among the Army of the Potomac senior officers to create a memorial for McClellan. And the likelihood of his nomination to oppose Lincoln had been a virtual given since the fall of 1863 when McClellan publicly endorsed George Woodward, 
the Democratic candidate in the crucial governor's election in Pennsylvania. In the spring of 1864, Lincoln had actually suggested outflanking McClellan's political ambitions by recalling him to a major command a military place in which he could be most useful, as Montgomery Blair described it. And Lincoln used Francis Preston Blair as an emissary to McClellan in New York. What exactly was offered is unknown. Perhaps appointment as a glorified chief of staff under Grant as general-in-chief. Perhaps even displacing George Meade at the head of the Army of the Potomac. And in a secret high-level meeting at Fortress Monroe, the subject of McClellan came up again between Lincoln and Grant in July. McClellan, however, ignored these suggestions. He understood all too well that this ploy was intended to prevent my name to be used as a candidate for the presidency. And in fact, Lincoln expected to be ignored because on November 11th, Secretary of State Seward interrupted Lincoln's description of the blind memorandum to protest that even if Lincoln humbled himself sufficiently to invite McClellan to co-manage what would have been left of Lincoln's term in office, McClellan would have found some way to dither out of Lincoln's grasp. Seward said, the general would answer you, yes, yes. And the next day when you saw him again and pressed these views upon him, he would say, yes, yes, and so on forever, and would have done nothing at all. Boy, Seward really had analyzed McClellan in depth. Lincoln's response was short and dismissive. At least, he replied, I should have done my duty and have stood clear before my own conscience. But this only begs the question of why Lincoln's conscience should have needed George McClellan, of all people, to be salved. Why should Lincoln not simply have said that, as President of the United States, he remained President until off March 4, 1865, and would prosecute the war with renewed zeal, entirely on his own, without involving McClellan, from whom he expected no cooperation anyway? For that matter, why did he even need to say that much? Since no one would have been in the least surprised if Lincoln had kept the machinery of war in full force until his last hour in the White House. And why should he need the witness of seven cabinet members to show that he had thought that way in August? The fundamental priority in Lincoln's skein of thinking occurs in the last sentence of the blind memorandum. You raise as many troops as you possibly can for this final trial, and I will devote all my energies to assisting and finishing the war. McClellan, in other words, was needed as a magnet for recruitment, and especially in the summer of 1864, re-enlistment of the three-year volunteers whose terms of service were ending. And indeed, if Lincoln had gone down to defeat at the polls on November 8th, the task of both recruitment and conscription after that would probably have been rendered impossible. And with it, any hope of any successful conclusion to the war. An announcement of McClellan's willingness to cooperate in some kind of interim co-presidency would sustain enlistment and keep up conscription. And most important, ensure that the veterans of the army would renew their terms of service when asked to by Little Mac. But wooing McClellan into some form of temporary interregnum between November and March might succeed in achieving a second goal as well, and that would be splitting McClellan from the larger web of his Democratic Party backers. After all, Lincoln's Republicans had renamed themselves in 1864 as the National Union Party with precisely the aim of wooing war Democrats to their banner. And Lincoln had even accepted as his vice presidential nominee exactly such a Democrat in Andrew Johnson. Co-opting McClellan would not depart very far from that strategy. 
It has been almost routine, reflecting on the conflict between Lincoln and McClellan, to imagine that these two were forever irreconcilable and that they represented two polar ends of the political spectrum. But McClellan, whatever his other faults, was a unionist which is to say that he understood the original object of the war to be the preservation of the Union, its constitution, and its laws, and was convinced that the Union of the states should never be abandoned. Much as he criticized a course which unnecessarily embitters the inimical feeling between the two sections, he told Francis Preston Blair that he also would deprecate a policy which far from tending to that end, tends in the contrary direction and still ends up in disunion. McClellan was also, in the end, a war Democrat. He roundly condemned Ohio Democrat George Washington Morgan's call on August 4th for an armistice, spluttering that these fools will ruin the country. And when he was finally nominated by the Democratic National Convention in Chicago on August 31st, McClellan labored through six drafts of an acceptance letter which eventually declared that he cannot realize that the existence of more than one government over the region which once owned our flag is compatible with the peace, the power, and the happiness of the people. This contrasted with embarrassing sharpness with the prevailing temper of McClellan's party. The Chicago Convention turned into a bacchanalia of anti-war fervor. The principal voices belonged to the Copperheads, to the Peace Democrats, Clement Vallandigham, Alexander Long, and Benjamin Gwynn Harris. While Samuel S. Cox, the Democratic minority leader in the House, was heckled with shouts of, get down, you war Democrat, and Vallandigham, Vallandigham. Maybe the only time there's ever been a cheer for a four-syllable candidate's name. <laughs> the party platform included a specific repudiation written by Vallandigham of the war and a call for an immediate armistice. After four years of failure to restore the Union by the experiment of war, during which, under the pretense of a military necessity or war power higher than the Constitution, the Constitution itself has been disregarded in every part. The public welfare demands that immediate efforts be made for a cessation of hostilities with a view to an ultimate convention of the states or other peaceable means to the end that at the earliest practicable moment peace may be restored on the basis of the Federal Union of the States. Not even McClellan was exempt from catcalls at the convention which nominated him. Alexander Long attacked McClellan as this weak tool of Lincoln's. And Benjamin Harris lustily asked, will you vote for such a man? I never will. Could a president-elect, McClellan, be peeled away from the loons of his own party? especially when invited by Lincoln to take up a military man's hand and join it in saving the Union, and especially over the four months when McClellan would not have peace Democrats hounding him from cabinet seats or from newly won seats in Congress. Lincoln, in the same situation back in 1860, had been begged by frantic Democrats and Unionist Whigs to issue some statement qualifying the Republican platform in order to head off secession, even to the point of abandoning his opposition to popular sovereignty in the territories. Why not McClellan now? After March 4th, McClellan's options would shrink, since he would be surrounded by a cabinet which would have to include peace Democrats, and compelled to conform to the dictates of a party which, as Lincoln said, will have secured his election on such ground that he cannot possibly save the Union afterwards. Given the stakes, it was certainly worth Lincoln's time to think about a strategy for unmooring McClellan from the Copperheads long enough to finish the war. But it was not worth thinking about it in public where the idea would dishearten his own party faithful. Still, it would demonstrate the sincerity of the offer 
If it could be shown that Lincoln had been contemplating this offer for a considerable period of time before the election, and not merely as a last second ploy to hamstring McClellan's victory. Hence the resort to a memorandum describing the offer Hence also the desire not to reveal its contents, but to have the cabinet as the senior officials of the administration and the people who would have to join in cooperating with McClellan in this experiment endorse the blind memorandum as proof of its and their genuineness. This would certainly have been something of a constitutional anomaly or at least a departure from anything that looked like conventional practice in presidential transitions. The Constitution dictated only that presidential transitions should be described as Congress may determine the day on which the presidential voting should occur. In fact, they didn't actually do that until January of 1845. And the Twelfth Amendment laid down March 4th as the conclusion of the presidential term. Apart from that, Nothing was said about what relationship in the meanwhile, if any, the outgoing president and the president-elect should have. And in the most notorious cases, John Adams sitting up till midnight on March 3rd signing judicial commissions, John Quincy Adams leaving town ahead of Andrew Jackson's inauguration so that he could avoid the spectacle, usually less said between the two was often the better. On the other hand, though, Martin Van Buren had graciously offered to move out of the White House two weeks before William Henry Harrison's inauguration in order to accommodate the old Whig general. And James Knox Polk yielded the presidency to Zachary Taylor in 1849, riding beside General Taylor in the carriage that conveyed them to the Capitol, and rejoicing, meanwhile, that he himself was relieved from the cares and anxieties of public life. But there was no precedent for the kind of cooperative interim Lincoln described in the blind memorandum for meeting with McClellan or assisting McClellan. And thus, there was no incentive on McClellan's part to join it. In the end, as he admitted on November 11th, Lincoln regarded the likelihood of McClellan grasping a cooperative hand to finish up the war as remote. Although this was not because McClellan, as Seward complained, was an inveterate ditherer, Lincoln offered McClellan a partnership, but notice, not a sacrifice of principle. Not at least the kind of principle Lincoln had been asked to sacrifice himself in 1860. The blind memorandum presented McClellan and the Democratic Party with no payoff for cooperation. No willingness to consider an armistice if Lincoln's little entente with McClellan failed to keep the armies in the field. No offers of compromise on tariffs, banks, railroads, and other issues so dear to the Democratic heart. And above all, no step backwards on emancipation. Much as McClellan was willing to resort to the dread arbitrament of war for the restoration of the Union, he was as silent as the Sphinx on the survival and extension of slavery, the status of the Emancipation Proclamation, and the rendition of contrabands and fugitives, which Lincoln had declared he would be damned in time and eternity if he allowed. We cannot see the blind memorandum more mistakenly than if we take it as Gideon Wells did in 1877, simply as a statement of Lincoln's despair, or merely another example of Lincoln's penchant for burying layers of meaning under short Delphic phrases. The blind memorandum was actually a document of determination that even in the worst case, Lincoln intended to move forward toward victory, even if that required an unconventional route. It was also a canny determination, pointed towards exploiting a rift within George McClellan's own party. And one might say that it was also a humble determination, since in the blind memorandum, Lincoln announced a willingness, as he had once said, to hold McClellan's horse 
if he will only bring us success. Despite McClellan's outrageous behavior toward Lincoln, passing the boundaries of insubordination and bordering in 1862 on treason, Lincoln always felt kindly toward McClellan and desired to befriend him as far as political necessities permitted. And in this dire circumstance, Lincoln was even willing to share the laurels of a prospective victory. At the same time, though, this humility did have its limits. The blind memorandum envisions Lincoln staying in the presidential race and losing, but not Lincoln stepping aside in the face of a certain defeat to allow a different candidate to run in his place. Surprisingly, for a man who often described himself as an old Henry Clay Whig, Lincoln was willing to explore a constitutional and political ambiguity which might well have had enormous consequences for presidential transitions in the future. But as Lincoln half feared and half expected, the blind memorandum and its proposal came to naught, not so much by McClellan's response as because of the news of victories at Mobile Bay and elsewhere, and even more momentous victories shortly to be won in September and October by William T. Sherman and Philip Sheridan, and then followed by Lincoln's re-election on November 8th. In any event, though, he would be secure in the knowledge that he had done my duty and have stood clear before my own conscience, something which, for any politician, is no small accomplishment. Thank you very much. Now, Cindy is giving me the nod for question time, so I believe the floor is open. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my recollection is that uh, Dr. Uh, Doris uh, Goodwin uh, Kearns uh, was asked what she would ask Lincoln if that was possible, and she said, tell me a joke, uh, what would you ask him? What would I ask Lincoln to do if I, if I could? If I could, if I could ask Lincoln to do something. All right, what I would say is find something else to do besides our American cousin tonight. <laughs> you know, like, lo let's go get drunk or something, you know, any. And if he, wouldn't, if he wouldn't listen to me, I'd go to the theater anyway and lock John Wilkes Booth in the men's room. There's a lot of, uh, Lincoln was sure he was gonna lose the election. Uh, can you give us what the atmosphere was amongst the thoughts of what was gonna happen in Congress during that election and what he was hearing from the governors or the senators and so forth? The governors had been sending warning signals, no question. Congress, this is a, this is a difficult thing to say because I was just writing an answer to a question from a former student who wants to work on the interactions between Congress and the generals during the war. And I had to write back to him and say, you know, there's really only two books I can refer you to. Two books by Alan Bogue, The Earnest Men on the Civil War Senate, and The Congressman's Civil War, an even shorter book on the House of Representatives during the war. But as soon as we move beyond that, the literature on the uh, on the Civil War Congresses, the 37th and 38th Congresses, is really maddeningly thin on the ground. I mean, we, we devote so much attention to what, what regiment stood where at what half hour on what particular battlefield. We, we put a lot of energy into that. But we do not devote anything even close to that to understanding, well, what's going on in Congress? What kind of strategies are being planned there? What kind of tactics are being used there? And at the end of the day, the victories or defeats experienced on the battlefield are really, in the long run, secondary to what is happening in Congress. Because if things don't happen right in Congress, then everything that the generals and the soldiers do in the field is going to go for nothing. This is a political war waged in a republic where decisions made by the judiciary, made in Congress, are extremely important. And yet, we know very little about what is going on there. Very little exploration in the way of diaries, a handful of biographies of prominent members of Congress. But we 
desperately need more attention to get devoted to the Civil War Congresses, how they were structured, how their committees were organized. Today, when we put on CNN or when we put on any of the, the news channels, right away we're seeing members of Congress who are giving interviews, we're understanding that so-and-so is the chair of this and that committee, and they're ho holding hearings. We know a whole lot more about our Congresses today than the kind of attention that should have been devoted to understanding the Civil War Congresses. So this is sort of my platform for saying, let's do some more research on the Civil War Congresses and the members of the Civil War Congresses so that we know what was going on there, what battles there, political battles, were being fought, what kind of personalities are being deployed, what's the tactics being used on the floor of the House of Representatives or on the floor of the House, uh, on the floor of the Senate, because what's happening there, those are battles and campaigns that speak to the, uh, the, the conclusion of the war as well. So that's a long answer for saying, I don't know, and I wish that there was an easy way of finding out. But look, friends, there's something to do right there for the next piece of Civil War related research you want to do. Go to Congress. Uh, Alan, I'd like you to put on your theological hat and talk about, about Lincoln's fighting his own Calvinist, uh, Baptist Calvinist determinist, determinist heritage by writing the memo. And second, you forgot to mention Bruce Tapp's book on the Com Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. Yes, I did. I said there were a few studies. <laughs> now, if you, want, if you want me to go on all day, no, um, no you don't. Um, there are, there are a few good studies, and Bruce Tapp's book on the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War is a remarkable piece of work, wonderful book. There are even a few memoirs of some of the members of Congress. There's a book by Henry Wilson on the anti-slavery measures of the 37th Congress, which is just marvelous for identifying how important anti-slavery measures, how the bills were written, how they were negotiated through committees, and how they were debated on the floor. Because, of course, when you're on the floor of Congress, you've got a, it, it's a strategy, too. You all, and if you look at the text of the Congressional Globe, which is for the 1860s what the Congressional record is for us today, if you look at how bills are introduced, how they're referred to committee, then how they're brought back on the floor, who speaks and the order in which they speak, that's all planned out very, very carefully in the party caucuses beforehand. And after a while, you can almost predict who is going to speak to a certain bill. In the Senate, for instance, William Pitt Fessenden is always the last person to speak before a vote is taken on a bill because Fessenden is the most venerable and respected member of the Senate. When Fessenden speaks, it's like E.F. Hutton. <laughs> so you watch this pattern develop in congressional debates, and you begin to say, aha, okay, I know who's going to be speaking next, because <laughs> this is going to follow the pattern. So it's not just a, a random debating society. These are very consciously orchestrated uh, tactics. Now let me answer your question. Uh, where, does, where does Lincoln's fatalism, as he often said it, that inheritance from his Calvinist upbringing come in. Well, I think it certainly does um, touch on this in the sense that Lincoln is one who really is, uh, believes that he can anticipate what is going to happen. He's fairly sure that whatever is going to happen is not going to be good. But then again, that's the way Calvinists did tend to think. You know, the story between the Calvinist and the, and the free will person the, the Calvinist um, uh, and the free will person are standing at the top of the steps, uh, and the free will person falls down the steps and says, I wasn't anticipating that. And the Calvinist falls down the steps and said, I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> but but I, can't pack, I can't pack too much theology into 60 words in the blind memorandum, so I'll leave it at that. Yes, down in front here. My favorite Civil War motion picture. Oh, uh, hands down on that one is Glory. I go for that all the time. Never get tired of, of watching that. And it's something of a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's something of a, of a pastime among our, our Civil War era studies minors at the college where we can bandy back and forth dialogue from, from the movie. You know, you, you look at someone who's misbehaving and you look at them real hard and you say, Colonel Shaw, he is swell. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, 
Yeah, def definitely, definitely glory comes in number one. I really, of course, really enjoyed the Spielberg Lincoln movie. And I know that we're, people were saying, oh, well, the Connecticut representatives didn't vote the way they were portrayed. Yeah, I know. It's a movie, okay. I would say that on the whole, about 90% of that is just, was just absolutely spot on. They did a tremendous amount of research on it. I can sit and give you a list of my things where I can pick at this and pick at that and pick at the other. But the extraordinary thing that I thought about the Spielberg movie uh, was this. I went to see it twice. The first time I went to see it, we got there at what I thought was going to be sufficient time. It wasn't. Um, 20 minutes before the film began, the theater was already packed. We had to sit down in the front row, which meant that we <laughs> kind of had to look up at the movie, um, which is more difficult for me than other people. Um, but what I, what I enjoyed about it was, was how many perfect details were manifest in it. There was one scene I was particularly looking for and this occurs fairly early in the movie when the camera pans on to Lincoln and the cabinet at the cabinet desk in Lincoln's office. And I was looking, all right, how faithfully are they reproducing the detail? Well, they, they were doing it wonderfully. But I was waiting for one thing. I was waiting to see if they got the lithograph of John Bright that Lincoln kept on the mantelpiece of his office. And I thought, that's going to be the, that's going to be the bridge of fools, okay? And as the camera panned toward it, bang, there it was. I say to my wife, there it is, there's the lithograph of John Wright. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at this point, the people all around us are thinking, okay. <laughs> it's kind of like being one of those people that go to the Metropolitan Opera and insist on singing along with it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was a dangerous movie for me to go to. Uh, but... Uh, Things like that really came across in an impressive way. The other thing about it that I liked so much was Daniel Day-Lewis's portrait of, uh, of Lincoln. It was funny because it wasn't until I'd seen it the second time and came away that I had to remind myself I'd been watching an actor. It was, it was that close to what my own mental image of Lincoln must have been. And there was, uh, there's, there was so much about it that I liked, uh, really did. So uh, I would have to give uh, Lincoln a very close second uh, that way. And it's not just for professional reasons either. Uh, I did, in fact, go to see Link Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. <laughs> that was more out of a sense of duty. But, you know, it was campy, and so, you know, you go along, oh, yeah, sure, right, okay. But once was enough. Okay.